Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are about to encounter our third provocation of the Congress. This is a new format for us. We want to thank the Banff Center for the Arts and for Arts and Creativity for sponsoring this segment of the Congress, which I think has been a really interesting idea generator for us all. We're very excited to have Jenny Seely with us today to lead this uh, provocation. Um, Two days ago, we heard about art in this context, yesterday, community, and today our provocation is about leadership. Um, Jenny is the artistic director of Grama, a company that refuses to be relegated to the sidelines, according to Lyndon Gardner of The Guardian. Grama is a force for change in world-class theater that boldly places deaf and disabled actors center stage. We are so, so happy to have Jenny as our provocateur today. Please give her a warm welcome. Good morning and thank you. Just a quick name check, it's Grey Eye, and I'll explain about Grey Eye in a minute. That's the name of my company. Right, so it's early morning, it's half past nine, so can you just put phones down, pens and papers down, need your hands free, just for a split second. Can you just sort of embrace yourself with passion? <laughs> but hold yourself, really hold yourself, yes? Now fling your arms out, so you have presence, now let your hands bounce a little bit. Just have a good look at me, it's okay, I'll give you permission. <laughs> Jenny. <laughs> I'm deaf, and all deaf people give each other a sign name because we are more than just J-E-N-N-Y. We're more than just the letters of our name. So what I'd like you all to do is to think about What's the glorious essence of who you are? What would your name sign be? And your signing frame is here. It could be you've got twinkly eyes, or your life's going mad, or you twiggle with your things, or your hair's very sharp, or you play with your glasses a lot, or you wear glasses. Now, if you want your name sign to be about glasses, it's how do you wear your glasses? How do you look through your glasses? They're not just glasses, they're more than that. So, I just want in your mind's eye to think about what your name sign is, and then I'll count to three, and everyone will shout and do your own sign name. Okay. So, if you've got something in mind? Right, come on, this is a collective effort. We are leading this session together right now. Okay, so, ready? Ready to shout your name out? Ready to show your hands? Say who you are. One, two, three. Yeah. Fab. And so, when you are now greeting each other for the rest of the day, please introduce your name signs to each other. And when you meet a deaf person, you can say, hello, my name is... She's a gentleman over there. So, deaf access sorted. <laughs> so, on that note, I know what I'm supposed to be talking about, but I'm sort of not going to talk about that because I want us to be planning next year's Congress. We've got to plan it better. It's extraordinary, but we can go one step further. One quite big step further, because we have been bantering around the diversity word, like it's smarted, like M&Ms, diversity, diversity, diversity. But I'm sorry, I don't want to be the only deaf person here. Why am I the only deaf person? I have in my phone hundreds of extraordinary deaf and disabled artists in my phone from all over the world. Why are they not here? I've got Kim somewhere. Where's my lovely Kim over there? Deb Williams is somewhere. There are a small cohort of disabled people here. But given that one in eight people in the world are disabled, we are not representative here in this in this conference, are we? So that's what we've really got to think about next year. 
look, I'm on borrowed time, so I don't know. Um, can you play the slide? I'm going to play a slide of, of actors that I work with as part of Grey Eye. I am the artist director of one of the world's best theatre companies. I love my job. <laughs> and it is absolutely about equality, about placing deaf and disabled people on the mainstream in the world on various different platforms, various different plays. So, I have, like I say, worked all over the world with other deaf and disabled people. And a bit like Tim says, when you meet with musicians, you start to, your hearts start to beat with one together. It's a shame when I meet other deaf and disabled people. It doesn't matter if the language is different, it doesn't matter if the sign language is different. We connect. And why do we connect? Because we know we have had to smash untold barriers to be in that playing field, to be in that rehearsal room. Actually, while it's in my head, the name sign for Trump is that. <laughs> Trump, don't forget. Universal sign, Trump. Um, you know, Jude was talking about how the LGBTQIA community really lobby on behalf of everything else. So do we. You know, think about war and conflict. War makes more people disabled than anything else. So where are those voices? You know, I go on marches, my deaf and disabled lot, we go on marches, poll tax, we go on marches, stop Trump coming to the UK, we go on marches, we go on marches. We are part of a big political landscape, but why the fuck are we still being sidelined? So, I took the word leadership. So L, this is in terms of why deaf and disabled people are not on the agenda. So L, lack of opportunity, lack of role models, and believe me, I was 40 when Marley Matalin was on West Wing. I had to wait till I was 40 to have a really positive role model on television. E, educational barriers. A, the big one, attitudinal barriers. D, dare not engage with us. Discrimination, damaged goods. E, embarrassment, we're expensive because we need interpreters, we need stuff, we need help, we need support, risk, it's too risky to work with us. S, shelf life, support. H, we're a hindrance. I, we're imperfect. P, we're a participant and never a leader. We're patronised, we're pitted, we're prejudiced against. Then I started because I was on a roll, from the plane, uh, thinking about women, and it's the same thing. Lack of education, lack of positive role models, educational barriers, attitudinal barriers, age. That's another one, certainly for women, starting their career after the children were born too old or young and not taken seriously. D, dependence, discrimination. E, ego, having to deal with male ego, tough one. R, Sometimes men run rings around women. There's a rigid structure that insists that men are better leaders. S, sexism, sidelines, same as disabled people, self doubt, shut out. H, humanness of women. We are essentially human. I, in lack of investment in our, in our, our potential. Um, and I put, oh, blimey, I put, yeah, identity crisis. Do we have to be like men or non-disabled people or do we have to fuck our way to the top to get on in this world? P, patriarchy, pay scales, and being patronised. So this is what I was thinking about this. And then when I was on the plane, I got, when I got off the plane, Facebook uh, message, Vogue, announces, you know, the hundred years of the women's suffragette movement, a hundred years of women, brilliant. Was there one disabled woman in that list? No. So it's 2018. I am... Um, I'm sad. I'm sad and I'm fed up. You know, disability doesn't bother what age you are. It doesn't bother whether you're a, what gender you are. It doesn't bother about what class you are, what your ethnicity is, where you live. It's not bothered about any of that. About any of that. It's everywhere. So access and engagement is every one of our responsibility. When I talk about access, can we keep the, the pictures going? When I talk about access, what do you think I mean about access? 
so we've got a, my lovely tutor who is with me, my interpreter. I couldn't, I couldn't go anywhere without her. I am blessed. I never have to go anywhere on my own. I've always got someone to talk to. It's brilliant. So I've got my dude. We've got ramps. We've got loops. We've got captionings. And when I make my work, I have to think about what is the access for my cast and what's the access for my audience. So we have sign language, we have creative captioning, we have on-stage live audio description. I break all the rules about what the working hours. I work with people who have issues around fatigue, who can't do nine to five. So maybe we do eight to four, three, two, and then that's it for the day. There are ways around it, always. And sometimes when you're navigating your ways around things like that for access, it serves everybody. It gives us space to be and to breathe. Right, I've lost my thread. Oh, yeah. I was, I mean, I'm very lucky. I was the, one of the co artistic directors of London 2012 Paralympic Opening Ceremony. I mean, what a massive gig to get. And for some reason, our whole creative team were men. How the hell did I let that happen? Great people, great people, but I tell you what, I became so savvy, so smart at how to present an idea, present it in a way so those men thought it was their idea and let it happen. Oh, God, it was exhausting. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know what? We had to get the show on the road so I couldn't be all pretty. I just wanted to say, come on, we've got a show to do. And also, in some of those meetings, I learned a lot. I go to a meeting with two male interpreters, and in the two male interpreters, everyone assumes that they are doing my job, and I'm just a little girl. Or I go to a meeting with two female interpreters, and they assume that they are caring for me. So every day, I have to think and negotiate and navigate around so many different assumptions and perceptions about me but I wouldn't have it any other way. I love being deaf. And actually, if I wasn't deaf, I wouldn't have my job at Grey Eyes, so I'd be buggered. <laughs> so I love, I love being deaf because how I see my world is different from how someone else sees their world. And I think one of the best things is, I was working with Alex Bulmer, who is a Canadian playwright, director, everything, blind woman. We did Sarah Kane's Blasters together, and we came up with such extraordinary artistic collaborative compromise. Because blind, deaf, two completely different agendas, but we found that way of completely and utterly trusting ourselves, trusting that we understood the absolute visceral nature of how we wanted to put this play on. But she had to let me just do the visuals, and I had to let her do the sound. And my God, we got it right. And I had to, sh I explained the visuals to her. She said, Jen, forget it, it's fine. I can hear what I need to hear. But I was a bit more mealy mouth because she had this moment where geese took off. And I spent ages, my ears to speak, because I said, I want to hear those geese. I said, Jen, the geese are not for you. So I had to get over myself. But that thing about geese, you must all know the geese um, analogy of leadership. You know, there's one goose at the front, then they've got the marvellous formation, and there's a goose at the back, and the goose at the back honks. So that's leadership from, leadership from behind, encouraging encouraging people to move forward. And the goose at the front takes away 70% of the effort so that those in the formation can take their breath and fly with ease and with energy. And if one goose tired or becomes injured or needs time out, it's a great idea, time out for goose, but anyway, um, so they fly out, but four or five other geese fly with them to carry on that same formation, to carry on that journey, to support them, lift them and guide them. So with that in mind, just thinking about leadership, it should be, we've heard a lot about leadership, but it's listen, locate, learn, engage, educate, enable everyone. 
it's advocacy, it's advising, it's allowing, it's ambitious, it's daring to be different, it's enticing, empowering, it's risk, it's rights, it's sharing solutions, it's harness, help, hone, hear, ignite, inspire, invite, participate, promote, and prompt. Me as a leader, we've been talking today about uh, technology, you know, around the table this morning. I mean, it's a young person's game massively, isn't it? I am like, ugh. So I have, at Grey Eye, a very young team, and they are in the thick of the world of what's going on much more than I am. They are braver than I am. So I don't have to sit and I think, oh, God, oh God, you know, I've got to leave them. No. I create a space at Grey Eye so that I can sit and watch and learn from them. They are extraordinary, extraordinary young people. I've got eight-year-old artistic advisors, and they say, Jen, the world's a bit shit out there, isn't it? I'm sorry, they do their London, they use the word shit. <laughs> Jen, it's a bit shit out there. Uh, what are you going to do? Can you make it better for when we go to college, when we want to go to drama school, when we want to be active? Can you sort it out? Yeah. I have to, don't I? That is my job. And I want to sort it out for them. I do not want them to have to battle in the same way that myself and my colleagues of my, my generation did. But my young team, I let them fly. I give them challenges. I let them lead their bit. And they do. And they make mistakes. Sometimes I will watch. They have to learn from mistakes. I let them support me. Sometimes I have shit days. Sometimes I don't know what to do. I do not know what to do. So I'm saying, help. And I have no shame of asking my 21-year-old administrator, Charlotte, I'm stuck here. What would you do? How would you get out of this pickle? So there's a real exchange of understanding from the board right through to my... To to my low-level staff, well, they're not low-level, they're both high-level as far as I'm concerned. The thing, though, that I was thinking about is they can fly and grow and become leaders because they know in the framework of grey eye, if the shit hits a fan, the buck stops with me. That is why I'm paid more. That is why I take on that responsibility because they know the backstops with me. So I ain't a leader, I'm a backstopper. I think that's my title from now on. And that feels right. It feels absolutely right. And the other thing that I think all of us need to do, if we are to attract and take more people on journeys with us, it's a bit like, I can't say the word, it's kintsuki. It's a Japanese word, so when pots fall and break, they're, they're put together with gold. I feel like that. I think I wear my flaws. My foibles, my flaws, my insecurities, my shit, I wear it with gold. Because there's no point being untransparent. I think as a leader, you have to be transparent and you have to be human. So I ask all of us to wear our flaws with gold and then you will gleam you will glean with humans and humility. And those people who are, feel like they're being sidelined, deaf and disabled people, might start coming and saying, I'm new to all of this, can I come on the journey with you? And because you now know your sign language, you can take people on that journey with you. We have to do that. I don't know whether any of the pictures were pictures from deaf and disabled artists, but please allow us, we have such diversity of thought, we have such different ways of engaging with the world, we think outside the box every single day, and that's a really useful resource. So I'm going to end, again, I need you hands free. Can you hold hands with somebody? If you're not near somebody, snuggle up, I want everyone to be holding hands. Go and move up, hold hands. <laughs> I've just been, I've just come back from working in Moscow with Deaf Blind Theatre Company. I've worked with some Moscow Deaf Blind and some UK Deaf Blind, and all communication is through the hand. So you can't have your fucking phone on. 
you've got to, you've got to have your hands. So I think I want to end my provocation is, sometime, can we put our phones down? Can we hold hands? Because the word unite was, united was mentioned a few days ago, and we have to hold hands around the world because it's a terrible, as someone suggested, it's a fucked up world. And, but together we are stronger, and together with more deaf and disabled artists in this room, we'll be mega. Thank you.